I think that was the beginning of the end of trust in the film industry. I wouldn't work for anybody, not for the smallest fee out of the contract today. It was a big mess and it took several years to sort it out and even to this day a lot of people in Singapore have not been paid. February the 6th, 1970. I left FZ today. It's really gone. Most people, even those unconnected with the film industry, could hardly fail to have been aware of the effect of the disastrous Heaven's Gate on the business of film entertainment. Chimino's protracted lacklustre creation became synonymous with the downfall of the major Hollywood studio United Artists. Yet few people, even within the industry, are aware of a significant precursor to that event. October 24th, 1969. Everyone is a bit touchy. The film really is in the balance. The story of MGM's abandoned project Man's Fate is one of bitterness and regret for those involved in the production. And it marked the end of an era not only in the extensive Anglo-American film partnership in film production, with the closing of the MGM Studios UK, but within significant American investment in British film production as a whole. The Italian producer Carlo Ponti who was still basking in the success of his 1965 MGM epic, Dr. Zhivago, had taken the subject of André Malraux's complicated novel, La Condition Humaine, to the studio, and the MGM bosses had decided to give the picture the green light. The film was retitled Man's Fate, perhaps aptly named as it turned out, and told the story of the Chinese communist failed insurrection in Shanghai in 1927 brutally quelled by the governing nationalist forces of Chiang Kai-shek. The film was amongst three heavyweight productions, Ryan's Daughter, Taipan and Man's Fate, all expected to give a new luster to the flagging MGM empire. Man's Fate was not the most expensive of these, but with an estimated budget of around $14 million and a glittering international cast including David Niven, Lee Vullman, and Max von Sydow, and of course the renowned Viennese director Fred Zinnemann. It was certainly one of the most talked about pictures to go into production at the time. 31st of October 1968. Asked if I'm interested in producing with Fred Zinnemann at around $50,000. Too good to miss. November the 4th. Meeting with Zinnemann. I can have the film as executive producer. I will advise him next Tuesday of my decision. Very tempting, enormous money. In October of 1968, all looked well for Man's Fate, and a young film executive, Andrew Mitchell, was asked to join Zinnemann's staff as a troubleshooting executive producer. Mitchell was my father, and he often related the circumstances of Man's Fate to me, after his death last year, and in possession of his diary, which he meticulously wrote up each night, I decided to investigate the details surrounding the film. Armed with a slightly dodgy recorder, I managed to arrange one of the last interviews with director Fred Zinnemann. Your father came on as the next person to perform a financial miracle. First class organiser, of course and had cut down the budget quite considerably. The film was to be shot on location mainly in Southeast Asia and MGM Studios in Elstree. Somewhat distinct from many of his contemporaries, Fred Zinnemann often spent longer on pre-production than on actually making the film. Film critic Alexander Walker. Fred always worked very hard indeed on pre-production before he started to shoot a film, and Man's Fate was no exception. Uh, I think he spent the better part of two and a half years involving quite a few trips to the Far East for location work and also to consult Han Suyin, the uh, Chinese uh, authoress, 
on the nature of the oriental aspects of Andre Malraux's book, and he paid every three or four weeks a visit to Paris to talk to André Malraux himself. And Malraux at that time was the Minister of Culture in de Gaulle's uh, cabinet. Uh, Fred told me that Malraux had to slip out of the back door of his ministry in order to meet him because, of course, uh, it was forbidden for any member of the cabinet to engage in any commercial activity, particularly if it related to his own uh, um, brief in the government. And Fred and André Malraux used to meet at one of the most expensive restaurants in Paris, but then uh, that's not odd that a socialist <laughs> should like to eat well with the rich, called La Serre. Uh, Fred said that the great problem that they always faced whenever they met was whether to have one bottle of wine or two bottles of wine. Because with two bottles of wine, Malraux became much more expansive, began to fire in all cylinders, and began to contribute, in fact, to the nature of the film script. Uh, to the extent that on one occasion he forgot that he had a cabinet meeting at three o'clock at the Elysee Palace until the maitre d'hôtel of La Serre restaurant came across to say that uh, President de Gaulle's secretary was asking where Monsieur Malraux was. July the 14th, 1969. I started work with Fred Zinnerman in London on man's fate for MGM. All rather difficult and lonely. Hope it improves. I found him slow and difficult, but marvellous to work with because he's a perfectionist, absolutely. Bob Leonard, who had worked on several Zinnemann films, was the casting director. Freddie would check and double-check, and he wouldn't take your word for it. He'd go back to the other people and see that everybody agreed and knew what they were doing. He's very quiet, but he can be very strict if he wants to be, you know. July the 28th. Meetings all day. I'm not really very happy with everything, but it's difficult to put a finger on anything wrong. Mitchell was still finding his feet with the Viennese director, nicknamed in the industry the Iron Butterfly, and referred to in his diary as FZ. July the 31st. A good day, I think. FZ agreed to my changes on the schedule. Difficult to know, though, whether I'm really getting through. 5th of August. Injections for Far East. Saw man for all seasons in the evening. Very interesting. Can't quite see why it was so successful. On August 27th, there were rumblings coming from the ACTT, the industry union that represented all camera and other related technical members of the film crew. Their complaints related to Zinnemann's wish to use an American special effects man. 29th of August. F.Z. in foul temper. Everything wrong. Met with ACTT re-special effects team. We'll probably get our way. September the 2nd. ACTT agreed to the American special effects man if we pay English special effects staff the same money. I had to agree, but suggested a small salary and the difference paid to the ACTT unemployment fund. Meanwhile, other problems with the production began to proliferate. The most significant of these was the untimely heart attack of the film's casting director, Bob Leonard. It fell to Mitchell to find a replacement at very short notice. September the 8th. Difficult day sorting out a new casting director. I finally fixed one at 11.30 tonight. FZ should be pleased. <laughs> Seventeenth September. Another bad night's sleep. Up at six thirty AM for flight to Singapore. FZ in foul mood in the evening with me and everyone else. <laughs> September the eighteenth. Went round the location with the group. Very hectic. FZ still testy, but trying to make amends. September the 24th, recce all day, jolly tiring for everyone. Dinner with FZ. Little news, except that new boss is appointed at MGM UK. October 21st, back in London, an early start at MGM. All going fairly well.
there was nothing in the air to suggest what was going to happen next. The major shareholder of MGM, entrepreneur and gambling casino giant Kirk Kerkorian, bought the controlling stock in the company, which was to become something of a regular occupation with him. Kerkorian had little interest in films, but he wanted the stability of a grand, if somewhat tired, trademark to give his slightly tarnished empire a sheen of corporate respectability. Film critic Philip French. Kerkorian and um, people of his ilk, they, they were people who had no experience of or no real commitment to film. They were businessmen who they were concerned with maximizing profit. They were concerned with real estate. They regarded the studios as a form of real estate, which led to, to, to say, the selling off of 20th century Fox's lot, which led eventually to MGM to not just the, the selling off of you know, everything that they could make money out of, like Dorothy's uh, shoes from the Wizard of Oz, but all the films that they were selling the studio's history. And as I say, they were not like the people who had created Hollywood, who from the time before the First World War up to the 50s and 60s still ran the studios, mayor at MGM, Harry Cohen, the creator of Columbia, Samuel Goldwyn, his own company, and the Warner Brothers, who, whatever you would say about them, sort of vicious, in some ways sort of d d dishonest, they cared passionately about films. They cared passionately about the reputation of their studios. And they also were, uh, it, as it, when it came to matters of business, though penny-pinching, they were sort of men of their word. It was well known that a handshake for them was as good as a signature witnessed before a battery of lawyers. The news of Kokorian's takeover swept like wildfire amongst studio executives, Wall Street and film artists. They all watched carefully to see what Kokorian's reign would bring to the greatly diminished MGM. Kokorian appointed a financially minded caretaker to tidy up the company's affairs, James T. Aubrey. Oscar Buesling, a legal representative for MGM in London, describes his new boss. Aubrey was known as the Smiling Cobra, he'd been known as a very tough man, and I had to go to see Gregorian when everybody said the studios couldn't be sold because of planning things, and I explained to him how and why they could be sold. But Aubrey was brought in as a fireman, and he behaved like a fireman. Yes. And I was his fireman, you might say, in this country, with the dreadful job of firing a lot of my friends at the studio, I was instructed to find a purchaser. I did. I didn't charge enough uh, for my services. And then selling the studios. He was feared by a lot of film people because he was totally ruthless in uh, enforcing his way of producing pictures. The unyielding and irascible Aubrey had a difficult road ahead. The financial state of MGM was appalling. Aubrey had only one single-minded goal, and that was to cut MGM's considerable running costs as per Kokorian's wishes. The most significant casualties were to be Carlo Ponti's Taipan and Fred Zinnemann's Man's Fate. October 23rd. Crisis day, with the news from the US of the cancellation of the film. The size of our budget will get MGM off the hook. FZ spoke to Ponte and MGM. Both said submit a smaller $10 million budget. Then we'll wait for a new board to be appointed. October 24th. Everyone is a bit touchy. The film really is in the balance. It depends on the budget. We must get it down to $10 million. October 29th. I gave MGM and all concerned a budget under $10 million, So they can't fault us on that. October 30th. Producing as usual, tension high. The film continued with rehearsals as the executive wrangling dragged on. But meetings with Ponty and the MGM board were not producing solutions to the film's present predicament. Aubrey remained implacable as he attempted to get the budget shaved further. November the 17th. I felt hopeful after our meeting yesterday with MGM, Aubrey, but today seems doubtful. 
November the 19th. A disastrous morning. It's all off. MGM have withdrawn from financing the film. There is no real hope, no. Everyone depressed. But we continue rehearsals. Film critic Alexander Walker. James Aubrey's brief was to cut down the expense of making movies. Aubrey had in fact visited uh, Britain before Fred began shooting his film and had uh, called for pay cuts all round. These people came to see me and asked me to accept, to go to the actors and ask to take a cut in order to make the picture. And I said I wouldn't do that. Fred, being an honourable as, as well as an uh, economically sensible man, had said, no, we've got to fulfil our contracts. But the difficulty was that the contracts that Fred uh, had with MGM had not been signed. Consequently, uh, when they were ten days into rehearsing this film that had taken two and a half years to prepare, uh, with an expenditure of something like four million dollars already, uh, James Aubrey and Kirk Kerkorian decided to cancel the film. Andrew Mitchell and Fred Zinnemann made one last desperate bid. November the 20th. We're still fighting to save the film. At the moment, we need $25,000 to keep the unit in Singapore and the outlets. November 21st, 1969. I gave everyone notice today. Trying everything, even asking the union for help. FZ is hanging on to everything and every suggestion or idea. Rehearsals cancelled. I think it was Aubrey who issued a pronunciamento very shortly after Man's Fate that no more films like that would be made, that they would be making films within the two and three million dollar <laughs> budget. And uh, of course that was soon broken because Hollywood has an unstoppable urge to inflation. Uh, but nevertheless, it was a very bad time. Some studios feared that they themselves might be forced into bankruptcy by having a, a large number of films in their inventory, more than the exhibition and distribution system could handle at any one time. Um, the British film industry suffered uh, for over a decade because Hollywood pulled back from this country. Uh, it retrenched and began to make movies in America, and particularly movies in the studios and the sets in Hollywood, rather than using Britain as a production facility, which it had done very successfully during the 1960s. November the 23rd, Sunday. I arranged a meeting with the state-funded National Film Finance Corporation to discuss backing. Poor reactions, as they really think big pictures should go. Also feel that this will bring unions and artists to their senses over costs. November the 24th. We're still fighting, but it seems impossible to get this going by Friday. We've been turned down by most people. The, the attitude of the world really changed to the kinds of films that were being made. The American cinema had grabbed the initiative because it had become a much more violent cinema. After the success of films like Bonnie and Clyde, the production code, which had begun to be relaxed, had almost disappeared. Uh, the sexuality of the American films, uh, the home-produced American films, was increasing, and there was less attractiveness to film abroad and to make films uh, of interesting and perhaps serious themes for the international film market. November 26th. Paramount are not interested at 10 million. I think they want you to meet FZ to suggest another film. They hate Ponte. November the 27th. I gave instructions to bring everyone out from Singapore. Assistant director Terry Clegg, who had travelled to Singapore with the first unit, was at a crew member's birthday party when he received the news from my father. Andy Mitchell was on the other end of the uh, phone and he said he was sorry to tell me that uh, unfortunately the film had uh, collapsed and that uh, MGM were pulling out and uh, they were going to wrap their involvement. They weren't prepared to go forward with it. I was completely and utterly stymied by that. I mean, I couldn't believe that this had come about just out of the blue. And I went back to the party, and then I'd been sat down a few moments, and, uh, and then I was called again, and this time it was Fred Zinnemann, a very upset Fred Zinnemann, trying to explain his part of the uh, saga. And uh, finally, I was um, put in touch with a, 
a lawyer who said uh, that uh, he was representing Fred's side of the affair and that um, I would have to try and extricate myself and um, the company as quietly and as efficiently as I could and try not to leave uh, too much of a mess behind. The majority of the construction team were on the books of MGM and so were given return flights home. But this did not extend to freelancers such as Terry Clegg. After we'd seen the construction boys off that night, I went back to Bill's house and while I was there, the phone rang and a man called Larry Cleary was on the other end who was Bill's boss in, in MGM in uh, London. And, and Larry didn't know I was in the room and he said to Bill, he said, uh, don't worry about Terry Clegg, he said, get yourself out of there, Bill, because this film's in trouble. They've got their own problems. Leave them to it. You just get on... Uh, get on the first plane and come home and I'm sure things will sort themselves out. Well, obviously Billy let me into the whole secret and uh, then I had to work fast then because I knew that we were going to be dumped. The dismantling of the production in Singapore was further complicated due to the film's many soon-to-be enraged creditors. Leaving Singapore openly was not going to prove easy. One of my colleagues there was a, a man called Tom Hodge. Um, he was the managing director of a company called Cathay Films, based in Singapore. And I said, uh, uh, I've been advised, Tom, by the company's lawyers that I should go round to all the company's creditors and explain the situation and say that we fully intend that they should get paid all in due course. And Tom said, Terry, he said, if you do that, you go to all these Chinese people and you tell them that you're going to not pay them their bills, you're going to get on the first plane, you're going to dump everything. He said there will be pieces of you all the way to the airport. I advise you to get out of here very quietly and very quickly. And I took his advice. But during this period, certain questions must have gone through the minds of my father, Ponty and Zinnemann. With the film having already committed at least $2 million in pre-production costs, the fact that a major director with an unblemished record and a star cast that was about to begin shooting, why should this of all the numerous MGM projects be cancelled? Many speculated as to the reasons, but the escalating costs of the film was probably most significant. The budget was going up too fast. And there was a kind of a financial crisis about it, which worried particularly the people at NGM at the studio, who had a number of very expensive productions going at the same time. MGM was certainly overcommitted, and the cost of another production was bleeding the company dry, Ryan's daughter, which was already halfway into its production. In an effort to curtail film director David Lean's supposed excesses, Aubrey visited him to try and make him take into account the company's present predicament. And at that point, these people went to see David Lean, who was shooting in Ireland, and wanted to have a meeting with him, but they said, no agent. And David said, no agent, no meeting, and wouldn't see them. I think it's true to say that uh, MGM were very concerned about the long shooting schedule well into the second year of David Lean's film, Ryan's Daughter, which uh, had begun shooting in Ireland and eventually was transferred <laughs> to South Africa <laughs> in order to achieve David Lean's idea of perfection in the storm scenes. And consequently, uh, Fred Zinnemann realized that man's fate had not got even the potential box office interest, the popular interest of a story of an uh, Irish girl and the village schoolmaster, like Ryan's daughter had, uh, and therefore he was really prepared for the, for the worse. And I think that MGM made that decision upon that calculation, that here you had a film which was set in Southeast Asia, a political film, the story of uh, the conflict between nationalism, that's to say uh, incipient fascism, and communism, uh, that's to say liberation, as it was perceived then, uh, based upon a famous book by André Malraux, but not a book that was in any sense a popular work of literature, or indeed a popular story. Yes, there was a love story in Man's Fate, 
But nevertheless, communism and Hollywood capitalism were um, uh, opposing forces. The political nature of the film may explain the lack of interest from other major studios, such as Paramount. Film critic Philip French. You have a situation in 1967-69 in which a studio is faced with the making of a movie in which the main characters are Russian and Chinese communists treated sympathetically with those people of character, people with a cause. And although the situation is historical, nevertheless, this was, relates to what was then a situation that was tearing America apart. In 1967, uh, John McGrath, an old friend of mine from university days, told me he was, uh, had been hired to adapt at Man's Fate. And I expressed my surprise about this. Uh, and I'm sure he wrote a very good script, which did justice to the novel. But it w I was not at all astonished when I heard that uh, Hans Suen had been brought in to radically rewrite this, or should we say, unradically <laughs> rewrite this. But you had, between the conception of the film in 1966 uh, uh, 67, when John McGrath came onto it, and the withdrawal of MGM. You had had the election of 1968, the terrible events of, uh, in Chicago. You had the, the fall of President Johnson who'd been brought down by the Vietnam War. You had, uh, had a, a right-wing government coming in and uh, fears that the Vietnam War was going to go on and on forever. And, and, and so, in weighing up projects then, at that time, they uh, moguls coming in uh, at MGM, assessing enterprises, must have thought that this is a very dangerous and risky enterprise. Uh, uh, I think this does not excuse the way in which they behaved over this particular commitment, which was absolutely disgraceful and an indication things were uh, to come in Hollywood, in fact, of the changing nature of the people who are running the studios. But nevertheless, from their point of view, you could see reason why they might wish to uh, withdraw from the project. Whatever the reasons, and probably all of them contributed, the film's chances of survival were to be completely discounted. Fred Zinnemann. Anyway, the long and the short of it was that, of course, no one got paid off. They, that they just didn't pay. So we took them to court. 5th of December. Meetings all day. We decided to take action against MGM following the meeting with Andrew Leggett, a legal counsellor. The die is now cast. All ACTT members paid up to date. Last payment for me too. On the orders of Aubrey and others, it was decided that the debts accrued by Ponty and Zinnemann for pre-production would not be settled by MGM. On hearing this, Zinnemann was, not unnaturally, disgusted at being dragged into this financial quagmire. The idealistic director did not appreciate the advice given by one MGM lawyer that his company should simply file for bankruptcy, leaving the creditors high and dry. Which was why Zinnemann decided to sue on behalf of the creditors. The curious thing was that the minute uh, MGM cancelled the shooting of the film, everybody connected with it, who could have been a valuable witness, disappeared into thin air, they all hid, because they didn't want to appear as witnesses. Not because they were guilty, but they just were afraid of being involved. Uh, there were only two men who stood up and were willing to go ahead regardless and knowing full well that they probably would never get another job at MGM. Uh, one, and one of them was Andy, who had enormous courage and while, while everybody else had disappeared, he was there uh, day and night helping the defense organize the case. December the 9th. We're still trying to find evidence against MGM and preventing out-of-pocket creditors taking action against Zinnemann's company. December the 18th. Terry Clegg in again. 
FZ rather difficult. All fed up with this clearing up, especially for no money. December the 19th. Every day is the same, preparing statements, etc. for the lawyers. Very boring. December the 29th. Back at work after the holiday, still busy preparing documents for the lawyers. Can't see an end to it. Meanwhile, the reputation of MGM was further denigrated in the trade press. Zinnemann blasts MGM cancellation Man's Fate. Fred Zinnemann yesterday blasted MGM's cancellation of his film Man's Fate as a wanton disregard of obligations entered into freely and eagerly by the company. Zinnemann in London. A £557,000 damages claim by American film director Fred Zinnemann and Italian producer Carlo Ponti against Metro Goldwyn Mayer for breach of contract is to be heard in the High Court in London. As the preparations for the lengthy legal proceedings continued to be collated by my father, he was now engaged in negotiating his future prospects. 22nd of January, 1970. I saw Leslie Grade. He told me he had said at the ABP board meeting that they had made a big mistake in getting rid of me. Film finances offered me Murphy's War. I accepted. £250 a week for 12 weeks. More than I expected. Andrew Mitchell was indeed employed in the capacity of completion guarantor on Murphy's War, directed by Peter Yates, and jaded by his freelance producing days, went on to take up the permanent position of managing director at Elstree Studios. February the 6th, 1970. I left FZ today. It's really gone. It simply confirmed that Hollywood was retrenching, going back to its own studios, its own American themes, and that the great British boom of filmmaking during the so-called swinging 60s was over. It was a kind of marker. It showed that the American companies, like Paramount and United Artists and MGM and Universal, which had been very active in financing British filmmaking during the 60s, were going back and spending the money on their own stars, their own themes, their own writers and their own film directors. After a long period of litigation, matters were brought to a kind of resolution. Fred Zinnemann was awarded limited damages. Given the long period of litigation and costs involved, it was hardly a satisfactory conclusion. No, I was not satisfied. <clears throat> because a lot of the creditors didn't get what they should have gotten as a result of certain deals that they were forced to accept. So, on behalf of the creditors, I was very, very disappointed. I think, on paper, we won, but, but nobody got anything out of it. Oscar Buesling was a legal representative for MGM in London at the time. I was purely the English and I had no say in the decisions, let me tell you that. Let me not pretend I was at that level. I was the English end servicing. I had no say in the decisions. What I did have was say in defending legally the decisions when they were made. And that we did pretty well. We were sued by Nathans and Bermans, Shepperton, Ponty and Bridge, David Niven, a whole series of artists, and we got away with murder, I like to think. We settled, having kept them out of their money for four years, we settled, and as I said, we settled by paying them four months' interest on money they never, they never received. Uh -oh. Four years' interest. And that was quite a good commercial venture. It got us off the hook. But then you must remember that MGM were somewhat short of funds, not very liquid at that time, and we were paying as many people were doing at the time of the crises in the 70s, we were, we were uh, finding it cheaper to defend the case than to uh, borrow money from bankers or finance the things or anything else. Many, many good lawyers, and I don't pretend to be a particularly good lawyer, were fighting, holding the dumbbell at arm's length, it's, as insurance companies do in so many cases. The damage caused to the British film industry by MGM's closure of their studio in England and massive reduction in investment was considerable. 
no film would be sanctioned by Aubrey unless it was under $4 million. But the wider implications for filmmakers were that signed contracts became essential. The era of the handshake was over. Casting director Bob Leonard was one of the people not to receive a penny from MGM. Fred used to ring me up months before, sometimes a year before he was going to do a film. And he'd say, would you cast it for me, Bob? And I'd say, yes, you know, because I could always fix it somehow that I can get out of uh, LC Studios, what I was doing there, I'll put one of my assistants on. And so I never asked him for a contract, and I worked for a year before the shooting f date of Man Man's Fate. So I had no contract, just his word, and that was it. So when I came to, to ask for my money, MGM said, we haven't any record of your work on this picture. I said, I've signed the contracts for about 20 or 30 artists already. So that's proof enough that I was entitled to do so. Anyway, they didn't pay me in the end. But I, I, Fred Zinnemann, he's a kind person. He knew that at that time I was in trouble because I had a heart attack. And he sent me a private check on his private account in dollars. Bob Leonard was not the only casualty. David Niven, who was supposed to have got paid, didn't get paid because he was one of those persons who never signed his contract until after he started shooting. Then he knew you, he had you on a hook and he could ask for other things and he wanted transport. So I said, naturally I'll pay transport. But he said, I, I want it all 24 hours a day. So I said, I can't agree with that. Whilst Leonard was convalescing in hospital from his heart attack, he found the worried star particularly attentive. He sent me a dozen red roses every week to the hospital I was in, saying, for Christ's sake, get back, Bob. I haven't signed my bloody contract and I won't get a penny. He was hoisted by his own petard. The story of man's fate was yet another footnote in the volatile film industry. Kerkorian may well have felt vindicated when a decade later, United Artists, soon after to become another Kerkorian purchase, was brought down by one single filmmaker's vision, Cimino's notorious Heaven's Gate. But of that, another time. What had one of the effects of putting years on his life to be honest with you, because with his reputation, he had the best reputation in the business, and suddenly to, to let everybody down who worked so hard for him, because it was a hard picture. I, I did not feel like working for a couple of years afterwards, because things like that affect you psychologically very strongly. And I was very distressed by it. I really did, had no desire to get back into that kind of life. Fred found it very hard for a couple of years to address himself to any future film projects. Uh, partly that was also the honourable nature of uh, Fred Zinnemann. He knew he had to get himself out of uh, a great deal of legal and financial trouble, and I shudder to think of the uh, sleepless nights Fred must have had seeing the costs of legal representation rocketing in uh, the United States and in Britain when he took on MGM. Uh, he won uh, eventually, but it was a Pyrrhic victory in which Fred did not get the, back the amount of money he spent. He cleared his name. He preserved his honor. He made it perfectly clear to the people who were working in the film industry that uh, Fred Zinnemann was not to blame for this. And I think he was satisfied with that. <laughs>